Well, hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our cross-shaped, storm-tossed family devotion. Um, we are just going to continue on with our uh, chapter of family as spiritual warfare. I really hope that you have with our service uh, and our happy Mother's Day uh, time yesterday. I, we, just, we just loved it as well. Um, but we're going to catch up into this chapter, Family is Spiritual Warfare. And let me just uh, continue to read Russell Moore's book, The Storm-Tossed Family. A newspaper wrote an article one time about some people who had criticized me really sharply for not taking political stands uh, they would want me to take. I was crushed by this. To the point I wondered sometimes if I could even get out of bed in the morning. I wondered why. I really was not worried about what those people thought of me. I believed what I believed. I was not worried about some bad consequences for me or for my ministry. Most people were affirming and supportive, even more than ever before. I slowly came to realize that what I was feeling was not regret or fear, but shame. The main thing I worried about was the father, my father, seeing that article. Or a sort of surrogate father in ministry seeing it. And concluded that I was a failure. I was worried that my children would see it and think that I had failed them. I was standing there with the report card again. Like the older brother in Jesus' parable of the prodigal, I too often believe I can earn my place in the house, my future inheritance, by doing the right thing, by behaving and performing and being deemed useful and likable. And like the returning exile in that story, I too often believe that I should be a hired hand not a welcome son in the father's house. My drive to succeed is really not ambition, but a drive to belong. To hear the words, you are my beloved son, and with you I am well pleased. Behind virtually everything I do, from teaching my children dinner table manners to writing this book, there's a little boy looking behind him, for his parents to see if they're looking to see if they're proud of him that's brokenness but that's not my identity and that's not my inheritance the gospel has to interrupt me constantly taking me away from my futile whirling dervish-like performance right back to that sky above the jordan river Many of you are in that similar place, whether you hide behind your athletic skill or your intellectual caliber or your artistic brilliance or your spirituality and morality. Those who perform for a father's recognition will find themselves failing. Performing for your identity and your inheritance does not lead to holiness, but to exhaustion, bitterness, and ultimately death. To do otherwise is spiritual warfare, and it's hard. When we learn to say, our Father, we enter into battle. As dependent children, we look to our parents for, among other things, the basic needs of security provision, and protection. Jesus asked, Or which one of you, if his son would ask him for some bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he'll give him a serpent. If you then, who are evil, know to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things? to those who ask him, 
Matthew 7, 9 to 11. No matter what your family background, you are not an orphan in the cosmos. The same Jesus who taught us to call God our Father also taught us to look to him for provision. Give us this day our daily bread and protection and lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. These are not separate requests. The devil came to our Lord in the desert and asked him to turn stones into bread. The devil was not trying to tempt Jesus. He was trying to adopt him. Family is meant to teach us, among other things, that we are creatures that we cannot ultimately provide for and protect ourselves. We are dependent in our infancy and dependent again in our old age. That sense of need is the first step of overcoming in a war-torn universe in which the family is often ground zero. In this, Jesus is not absent from us or ashamed of us. He is with us. He finds his identity in his Father's blessing. He watches his Father's vocation and finds there his own. He also, at the cross, finds himself a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons, because the zeal for his Father's house consumed him. The cross informs what it means for us to be a family, and our lives and our families are meant to drive us back to the cross. The kingdom is breaking through, and the family is a sign of this kingdom. And that's one reason why the powers of darkness want to rage against it. That's not true only for the family in abstract, but for your family in particular. Whatever your family background, you can be faithful to your family. Whatever your family situation, you can be a part of the family of the church. You can fight this battle, but you can only do so if you know who you are and if you know where you're going. No matter what, the call to be family is a call to hardship, to suffering, to combat in the spiritual realm. And sometimes the only weapon you can find in this battle cry is, Jesus loves me, this I know. Through it all, you will hear a persistent question from the defeated powers of this age, from the nagging fears in your own psyche. The question is, who is your father? You have an answer to that question. The answer is shaped like a cross. I love this uh, last statement that he says. He goes, it's the only weapon that you can find is this battle cry in our spiritual warfare, and that is, Jesus loves me, this I know. Kind of reminds me of my care home services that I would do in my previous city. We would do two care homes and once a month. And again, for some of these patients or uh, guests that were living in these care homes, you know, they were in different kinds of vulnerable states, sometimes a little bit locked in, and it was one of those kinds of songs, those 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 theologically rich hymns that that would kind of unlock them for a period of, of time. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And is it as if it would trigger the good memories and but yet also the hard memories? I have a hard time sometimes, and I know I need to grow in my discipleship. But I, I try not to say the good and the bad, because bad is a relative term. Because I would look at it in the moment and go, oh, that's such a bad time. But then I've had to be challenged to use the better word, the better diction. It's good and hard. So for when these 80, 90-year-old people are kind of awakened and triggered 
because they hear this I know for the Bible tells me so or in the garden or they would hear the old rugged cross. These would trigger not only happy memories, but they would also trigger hard memories. Losing children, losing grandchildren, losing husbands, coming out of war, moving to another country, the hardships of, of life. But in the same flip, the goodness and the faithfulness and the provision and the protection of God, their Savior, God, their Redeemer, God, their tower and refuge and strength. And there would be times where I'd see these, these people that would be somewhat trapped in their, in their uh, wheelchairs and they would start to come alive and start to, to kind of, quote unquote, sing the, these songs. And all you, then you'd see tears run down their face because it would trigger all of that. It triggers me. It triggers you. Family is spiritual warfare. I agree with that. Because so much of the narrative of the Bible is done in the context of family. Just look at the Old Testament, especially just look at the, the, the chapters in Genesis of f biblical families wrestling with good, bad, in the sense of evil, evil being done onto them, and then hardships. And as they remain strong and they, they, they know who they are and they know where they're going. I would add the other part to that too is not only do they know who they are, know where they're going, but they know whose they are, who they belong to. I think that's where freedom comes in, where Jesus, you know, releases those that are in bondage spiritually and emotionally and relationally. I think the woman at the well in John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman that meets Jesus Christ, there's a, there's a freeing of her soul because he speaks straight to her heart. And he says, this is who you are. This, this isn't who you are. This is where you're going and this is who's your. You belong mind, body, soul, and spirit to God. I think that's the encouragement we need this morning. Amen, church? Like, we need to know who we are and where we're going and who's we, who we belong to. And if you've been doing church alone, if you've been doing this life alone, if you've been kind of separated or segregated or just you've self-isolated or self-exiled yourself, let me speak to you very clearly. That's not God's heart for you. I, I think one of the, not chief aim of the enemy, but I think the enemy really wants you to believe that independence is like number one thing. That you could be your own man or be, do it on your own steam. And, and I'm all about you know, self-reliance and being resilient, but it's so, it's so lonely doing things alone. Part of the family of God is you have to trust and open yourself up to be loved again. I had a guy one time in church. I'll call him uh, Jim. Jim and his daughter. I, I first met uh, his daughter at youth group. And he was kind of one of those uh, latchy dads. Like he just wanted to like be really close to his kids. There was a, um, a separation in the family. So he was trying to make up for time, whatever. So Jim would just kind of hang back in the youth room while you know we would be doing youth ministry later on his daughter became one of our youth leaders he started to come to the church that we were um that we were we were doing and i remember one time uh jim would only come to me whenever he had an agenda like he uh was trying to work on some project with the city council and um, he thought, oh, you know, I need some, I need some help now. So he'd come and knock on my door and, and he'd lay out the plans, literally lay it out on my desk and here's what you're going to do and here's what I'm going to do and we're going to do this, 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 and this. And I would just look at Jim going, Jim, I don't know you. And he's like, well, and he, and he kind of like this, it's, it's okay. We'll, we'll work, we'll, we'll get to know each other through this project. And I said, no, but I know your daughter and, and, and because we've done life. She's opened herself up to, to a group, to a family. Uh, um, you know, in Hawaii, we use the word ohana, like this. We've, we've, she's part of us now. 
And I know you've been on the fringe, you've been on the margins, you've been on the, on the edge, just kind of always one foot in, one foot out. And so you're asking me to, to dive deep into a huge, massive project. But Jim, I just don't know you. And I, and I challenged him, I said, Jim, you're also, there's an invitation for you to be known here. He's like, oh, I, I want that. I said, okay. Would you be open to share your, like your, your real self, your authentic self? And he never did. He always wanted to just give just enough that was safe, just enough that was like the professional side of Jim, just the, the organizational side of Jim, just the just the the Jim, capital J Jim, just like let me just tell you like what you need to see of what I am. Sadly, Jim never really connected into the body, never felt a part of the family. Jim was his own worst enemy. Jim exiled himself. Meanwhile, his family, his kids, found Ohana, found family with us. I would hate for you to be like Jim this morning. Let me just be what I think Pastor John needs to see. I, I, like, I don't care. You, yes, put your foot forward and, you know, impressions are great, but I, I don't care. And if I don't care, God doesn't care. God just wants your heart. So give me the good, the bad, and the ugly. I, I, nothing in this world <laughs> at this point in time in my ministry, nothing scares me. And you'd be surprised. Well, that's how Jesus engaged everyone. Tax collectors, people that were marginalized, disenfranchised. But he also met with Pharisees, like, he just loved everybody. And he did it in the context of Fano, of family. But that's a hard concept. I know you're going to have to struggle with that. You're going to have to chew on that. You're going to have to trust God in that. Look, I'm just now rambling. But uh, God bless you. And we'll see you tonight. And uh, we're praying for you for greater connectedness to family. Okay, bye for now.